Hi everyone, Mike here from Watch It Paint It, and in this video I'm going to be reviewing and showing you how to play Warhammer Quest Lost Relics, kindly sent to us from Games Workshop. Adventure 1 is pretty basic, so we'll start off with Adventure 2 to give you an idea of how the game is played. So the first step is setting up the game board. Find the map tiles that match the ones shown for your chosen adventure, and lay those out as shown in the diagram. Also grab some of the door tiles and place those between the map tiles in the same places as the diagram. Make sure to turn them to their closed side, it's the one with the black bars. The next thing you'll want to add is the enemies that start on the map. Look at the top left of the adventure and you'll see the creatures you'll need to use. Adventure 2 has two types, Death Rattle Skeletons and a Death Rattle Warden, which is a boss type. You can tell which one is the boss or the leader by the tiny white crown on the bottom of their picture. The crown is also on their token as you can see here. Place all the creatures in the starting rooms shown on the adventure map. Next you'll want to place down all the heroes. Look for the black skull symbol on the map. This is the starting room so place all of the heroes here. The last thing to place is the treasure. The crossed sword and axe mark the location for the treasure token. There's also a spot marked Haven. If you have a hero who was knocked out of action last adventure, then they would start here. Now that all the game pieces are in position, you'll want to take out the enemy cards and the hero cards. Since this mission includes a Death Rattle Warden, I'll take it from the leader deck, and I'll take the regular skeletons from the minion deck. This game is balanced for four heroes, so regardless of the number of players you have, you'll need all four heroes. Assuming this is your first mission, set down all of the heroes on their unwounded side. Luxa Stormrider has a companion, so whoever is playing this hero should also take Taros. The companion is able to perform special actions if Luxa uses one of her actions to command it. Next I want to look at the hero cards. Each hero has their own abilities, but they all play pretty much the same way. At the top you see three squares, and these are for your action dice. At the start of each round, all players roll three dice and place them into the squares. To perform an action, you spend one of these dice, so each player gets three actions per turn. The actions you're able to perform are listed on your card. All heroes are capable of a move, rest, or interact action. All players also have one or more attack actions and a special action they can perform. In this case, the special action is Energize. To use any of these actions costs one of your die. However, for each action, there is an associated number. This number indicates the die value you need to do an inspired version of this action. So for instance, the move action has a 4 plus next to it. Normally when you move, you can move two spaces. But if I use a die that has a 4, 5, or 6 on it, I can move three spaces instead of two. Likewise, the rest action has a 6 plus next to it. That means if I use a die that has a 6 on it, I can heal my hero for two wound points instead of one. Next I'll talk about the attacks. Each hero has one or two attack actions. If you see the crossbow, that's a ranged attack and it can hit anything that's in an adjacent space. The brackets means it's an area of effect attack and hits everything in the space, including friends. There are two numbers here for damage. The first one is your normal damage and the second one is the amount of damage you do if you make an inspired attack. In this case, you need a die that's five or higher. The crossed swords means a melee attack, which can only target enemies in the same space as you. Last, we have the special ability, which has two different versions, normal and inspired. This particular ability lets you adjust one of your die up or down by one, or for the inspired version, all of the heroes get to adjust one die by one. It may not seem that useful, but when I talk about chain actions later, it'll make more sense why you would want to use this ability. The last thing on the hero sheet is wounds. There are wound counters you can use to keep track of your hit points, which are indicated under the profile picture. I prefer to use a die for this, and if you're a gamer like me, you likely have tons of other six-sided dice laying around. Next up are the enemy cards. This one is much simpler than the hero card. As you can see, this guy has two wound points, and along the top are three abilities. 
If the skeleton is visible to you, it will use one of these abilities starting in the order that you see them. So if it's in the same square as you, it will attack. If it's one square away, it will move towards you. If for some reason it can't move or attack, it will then use Rise, creating another skeleton to join the battle. Next we have the Death Rattle Warden. This is a leader type and has more abilities than the minions. Like the minions, it will attack if it can. If not, it then uses Command and then moves. Command will cause all skeletons visible to the Warden to move one space towards the heroes, and then resurrect yet another skeleton. There's also an ability for the leader phase, but this doesn't happen until the end of each turn. Alright, next I'll talk about each phase. This looks complex, but most of the phases are very fast and easy. Only the adventure phase and the action phase take any time to complete. Adventure 2 has five things that happen at the start of each turn. First, you start the timer. This mission has a time limit of six turns. At the end of each round, you move the timer to the next lowest number. We can easily do the next four things all at once. So first, place a new skeleton as close as possible to one or more heroes. Then you move all skeletons one space closer to the heroes. You then move the warden one space closer to the heroes. And then any skeleton that can attack will do so. So first I'm placing the new skeleton down, and if you're out of skeleton tokens, you skip this part where you add a new one. Next, all of the skeletons and the warden move one space closer. When enemies move, they always treat doors as though they are open. That means that these two skeletons can pass freely through this closed door. Now, one of the skeletons is in attack range, and according to the enemy card, the skeleton does one damage. So I need to choose one of my heroes to be struck and apply one damage to him or her. The next phase is the dice phase. This one's pretty straightforward. All players roll their three action dice and then place them onto their hero sheets. For the initiative phase, shuffle the four initiative cards and place them down. This is the order in which the heroes will act during this turn. Action phase. As you can see, there's a skeleton problem. The action phase is where the heroes and enemies take turns beating on each other and performing other actions. Each hero has three dice and you spend them to perform one of the actions on your card. Since Doraz is first and facing a skeleton, he's going to spend one die to do two damage to that skeleton. He could use a die with a six on it to do three damage, but in this case a die with just a one on it is still going to do two damage. Now that one of the heroes has taken an action, one of the enemies takes a reaction. You could choose the enemy that acts unless there's a visible leader, in which case the leader acts. Also, enemies prefer to attack the hero who acted last. Any one of these skeletons can take an action, so I pick one and move it one space closer towards the heroes. Now let's say you have a greedy player who just runs for the treasure and then gets themselves into serious trouble. You always have a player like that in co-op games. In the situation you see now, Regis is going to get his ass handed to him as enemies react to other players moving around and fighting. However, Regis and Luxa have die numbered from 1 to 4, so that means that they can perform a chain and the enemies can't react until Luxa performs her final action. Regis goes first with his die roll of 1 and nabs the treasure, then he draws a random treasure card from the deck. Luxa has a 2 on one of her die, and then a 3 and a 4, which means she can now perform all three of her actions right after Regis before the enemies can react. She uses her 2 to move forward, then she uses her 3 to make a ranged attack doing 1 damage to a skeleton, and then her 4 to make another attack, killing that skeleton. Now the skeletons can finally react. Since the leader is visible, it will perform its action. It can't attack, so it performs its other ability, Command. This causes adjacent skeletons to move forward, then it causes a new skeleton to spawn, and finally the leader moves one space closer to the heroes. The leader phase. If there are any leaders among the enemies, look at their leader phase ability. The warden has the ability rise, so at the end of the turn, it resurrects one more skeleton as close as possible to a hero. This room can only hold five creatures, so the closest space is either above or below the space with the heroes. If 
Finally, you have the recovery phase. If any heroes lose all of their wounds, a hero can run to the haven and a fallen hero can come back, but in the wounded condition. You're wounded until you start the next adventure. If no one brings you back, you start in the haven of the next adventure, again, in the wounded condition. So, would I recommend Lost Relics? Well, yes and no. This is the kind of game my wife and friends would play on a weekend, blast all the way through it, and probably never touch it again. However, if you're relatively new to board games, or if you have friends that you're trying to get into board gaming, this is definitely something you want to pick up, uh, especially if your friends think that Settlers of Catan is the pinnacle of board gaming. Also, if you're a fan of games like Zombicide, Black Plague, Massive Darkness, then you're going to love this game. So I wouldn't necessarily buy this game for myself, but I would definitely buy it for my kids. I love a really good four-player co-op, but my friends and I game all the time and we're always looking for games with more and more complexity. And this one is a slight step down from games like Blackstone Fortress. So for the pros, it is a really fun game. The whole thing fits into one box, it's not super expensive, and it's great for new gamers. If you're a hardcore board gamer, you might want this for your collection. But if you're like me, you'll binge all 12 missions in a couple of days. Anyway, I hope this video was useful. Let us know in the comments or Discord if you want to see more videos like this. And thanks for watching.